Good afternoon and thanks for joining us today. This is our 13th webinar in the series on the convergence of technology and wetland science. My name is Mike Connors. I'm the Director of Customer Success at Ecobot. Today's conversation is going to be about the mobile mapping landscape. I'm super excited to have two of our customers with us today to share their expertise. So Callie and Scott, thanks so much for being here. We will give you a proper intro in just a minute. Uh, just to uh, talk about logistics for a minute, uh, for everyone who's joined, take a look down at the bottom of your Zoom window. You should see a Q&A button. Please feel free to use that anytime you have questions. Uh, let us know if you're directing a question to uh, specifically who you're asking, um, and we will actually address those probably at the end of each section. Um, and also, uh, for anyone who's curious, we always record these webinars. So if you've registered, you'll get a follow-up email uh, to send a link to the video. So you can watch this again later if you need to leave early. Um, our host today is Jeremy Shady, co-founder and chief scientific officer at Ecobot. Um, Jeremy, I will heed to you. Go ahead and kick things off. Great, thanks, Mike. And Welcome back to, for those of you who have participated in this monthly webinar for the last year plus now with us. And for those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. This is a, a big part of Ecobot's integration in our outstanding collaborative industry of natural resources scientists. And uh, we love putting these, these programs together and getting, wonderful guests to join us from within the industry, uh, either as consultants or regulators or people working in NGOs or conservation-based organizations um, and uh, you know, keeping things fresh and keeping a sharp eye on where things are going in respect to wetlands and technology. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off and uh, with, with a quote, I always like to start with something that I feel like really ties into where we are in the now, but also the stitches across time. For those, some of you might be aware um, that within the last couple of days, the uh, EPA has announced that it's going to repeal the uh, navigable water rule. Um, and uh, that was, uh, of course, implemented by our previous administration. So I think we're gonna see some interesting times ahead of us. We're probably gonna see a lot of projects trying to be rushed in to get JDs uh, uh, on, on wetland and other water determinations. Um, so we're in for an interesting time, um, but I think more than anything, I love this particular quote by Abraham Lincoln in that uh, whatever we're setting into motion is going to have a ripple effect on the future. And for those of us here as scientists or regulators, our actions both in the field on specific projects um, up to landscape level management, all the way up to uh, projects that are in, in impacting policy and where things are going, all of that has a major ripple effect um, on where the generations who come after us will be able to pick up the reins and continue to run with that. Um, and so speaking of next generations, I, I wanted to uh, pull up this map here and, uh, you know, I, and tell a very short story of uh, a couple summers ago in Ireland, I had a couple of millennials with me and one of the guys I have, of course, I'm still using paper ordinance maps because I love paper maps and I love the way they smell. I love just getting all the granularity and the fact that I don't have to plug it in. But that's sort of in juxtaposition of what we're talking about here. The essence though was one of these guys was literally trying to use his finger like the blue dot on uh, any of your GPS to like run and make guesstimates based on where we were driving um, as we were trying to get out to one of our sites up in the uh, Sleamish mountains just south of Sligo. And, um, he kept having to recalibrate himself to like figure out, you know, like how the distance that we were traveling. And so it's a fascinating time that we're in where uh, paper maps and the ability to orienteer um, is a skill that I feel is still vitally important and that everyone should know how to do that's doing field work. 
But at the same time, we have a phenomenal amount of technology that is helping to advance our mobility and our capability to not only track things in the geospatial landscape, but also to transfer from the field um, into remote conditions or into uh, clouds or places that are housing data that can then affect policy and the building. So anyway, it's just a little fun story to kick us off here. Um, this is what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to do a little brief introduction for our, our panelists and presenters uh, here this afternoon or whatever it is, wherever you are. Um, and, uh, and then I'm going to do a little briefing on GNSS receivers um, in respect to mobile mapping. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time doing a little bit of a dive into the weeds with uh, workflow in respect to mobile mapping. Um, with a couple of different constellations of software and hardware with our guest presenters here today. Uh, put in a brief plug for our next uh, webinar topic towards the end, and then we will move into a Q&A. Um, and so during that Q&A, typically we'll have, you know, about 20 minutes for that. Um, and so one of the things that I suggest for all of you as listeners, Mike already spoke to this briefly at the beginning. I know we've got more people who have entered the room now. Down at the bottom, you'll see if you let your uh, cursor hover over the screen, you'll see a little box that says Q&A. So if you have any questions that come up either for myself or for Callie or for Scott as presenters, as they're talking, like please insert them in there so that you don't lose them. And then when we move into the Q&A discussion at the end, um, I'll curate those and either lump them together or you know, take them live or we'll try to answer some of those via uh, text. Um, if there's anything that's more conversational based, whether it's for the whole presenting group, um, you know, for any of our support team here at Ecobot, like Mike or Amelia, who are on the call uh, or in the Zoom here as well, or if there's just anything you just want to kind of give a shout out to anyone, um, then you can hover over the box at the bottom that says chat. And so you can just insert that info in there. So technical and questions related to content focus in on q a we'll talk about those at the end chat will be more just kind of rolling discussion um yeah so without further ado i want to introduce our uh our panelists and presenters here today we've got uh we uh you know for those of you who've been here in the past you know, we have a much smaller panel than we have had in the past. And part of that is because we wanted to really get into the granularity of how things work here today, not just, you know, talk about things from a high level, but a lot of what we're going to see is you're going to see some uh, video shares, some screen shares. What do things actually look like um, when, uh, when our presenters or their teams are out in the field? Um, and collecting the data and mapping out what their what their findings are. Um, so Scott Denham, some of you may have recognized from ESI permitting manager. He's uh, he's been uh, a presenter on several other other webinars over the last year and a half or so. So Scott, welcome back. Scott's based up in uh, the central eastern part of Ohio. Um, you know, of course, my home state. And uh, really excited to have Scott join us here again today. And then Callie is hailing all the way in from Southern California. Um, she's a biologist, environmental analyst with, uh, with DUDEC. And uh, we've only been working together for what, a little over a month, month and a half, but have thus far really enjoyed the conversations that Callie and I have been having. She really likes to get in on the, uh, on the taxonomy of things as well. So of course I'm having a blast with her. So um, let's go ahead and, and kick off. And uh, first, I want to kind of frame things up from a super high level, looking at the GNSS receivers, um, the constellations of satellites that we're looking at when we're drawing uh, upon geospatial information uh, with those receivers, and then how, of course, on a general level, how that's pairing with, with the mobile mapping landscape. Um, I've spoken to this briefly in the past, but what we're talking about here is this ecosystem revolving around wetland science and natural resources. Uh, we have uh, our GIS software, whether that's Esri products or some of the other uh, software that people are using. Um, we've got the GPS or the GNSS receivers that, uh, that the field teams are using out in the field 
to collect that geospatial uh, data. Um, and then of course, we've got the field applications uh, that actually allow for the processing of the regulatory um, the data that is necessary for any of the regulatory reporting. Um, and so this all, of course, constellate around one another, feed and, and nourish one another, and just as in a regular natural landscape. So one of the things I wanted to just touch into here, I've been speaking to GNSS. Some people are maybe not familiar with what GNSS uh, is referring to. So um, GNSS is the roll up of all of the different satellite systems that are now available on the planet. So GPS, of course, is what is, is the oldest and it's what services North America, but I believe that there's only 24 satellites that exist in that particular constellation. Um, and so now we're also drawing upon European, uh, Russian, Japanese, Indian um, satellite systems as well, um, which gives us the ability to draw on more uh, relay points for triangulating where our points are located. And so I just brought up this brief uh, GIF image that a uh, uh, colleague and uh, channel partner with Tremble, Gail Shea, uh, has recently used in a couple of our workshops that we've uh, put on with Society for Wetland Scientists, um, as well as Wisconsin Wetlands Association. But basically what we're looking at here is the play and the movement the orbiting of all the satellites around the Earth and based on where those satellites are in their orbit and on where you are in your current location, your GNSS receiver, your GPS receiver is going to be drawing, pulling down from each of the available within uh, sight distance uh, satellites that are available. Um, and so when you are utilizing a receiver that draws from all of the constellations, so the GNSS receiver, it's giving you much better accuracy in terms of location because it's not just pulling from our 24 GPS satellites in North America, but it's pulling from all of those constellations. All right, how does it work? How can we take a little bit deeper dive into this? What's the functionality of this? Here's, here's what you need. You need, your, you need your smartphone or you need your iPad. Um, some, some pieces of software will require you to have an app in order to pair to a GNSS receiver, which you'll get to see a little bit of from Scott and Callie's presentations here shortly in terms of how that works, how that looks. Um, and then of course you actually need the, uh, the Bluetooth enabled receiver. And then you need some sort of uh, software or application that is allowing all of that to be tied together so that then you can gather the data that you need, whether it's just the geospatial or if it's also the, uh, uh, the, the analytical and uh, uh, observations that you are making out in the field. Uh, here are some of the leading GNSS receivers uh, that allow us as field scientists to actually gather sub-meter accurate uh, geospatial data in respect to the projects that we are working on. Um, we're pretty excited to be in partnership with all of these organizations as well and to have uh, multiple different companies who are utilizing variant, you know, groupings of hardware or just all in on one or the other, um, but pretty excited about what that looks like. And so just to kind of give you a, a little, again, sort of a broad level perspective of what that looks like with the GNSS receivers, you still need to have your interface either with a, with a phone or some sort of tablet that that data can then be uh, presented, um, mapped, gathered within, and then exported for later use modeling and report preparation. Um, some of the leading elements that we're going to be talking about today, of course, is are the three uh, logos that you see on the screen here. So you've got ECOBOT for the, uh, the, the wetland delineations, et cetera. And then um, on the, the additional mobile mapping side of things, you've got field collector. I've got the little uh, red line going through that just for those of you who maybe are hearing about, hearing about field collector today. 
for your first time or just migrating into the use of Field Collector, just know that that is getting phased out this year. Um, and so everything's going to be moving over to field maps. Um, and so that is where um, that's where things are going to move and look like. And so these are just some example screenshots of what you're looking at inside of these applications. And again, you're going to see a little bit more of that as uh, recorded videos from our presenters here shortly. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time um, and have just heard a little bit about Ecobot, Ecobot specifically is a hyper specific tool at this point for the wetlands monitoring and delineations and we're building out additional service areas um, in, our, in our current fluctuations and, and uh, road mapping. But pretty excited about the interactions and where we are growing inside the industry. Mostly what we're hearing from people is that they're just they're more competitive, um, that they're able to complete a, uh, a higher volume of work with the same amount of team. Also, the ease of being able to send data remotely from the field um, or to be able to send data from field teams to GIS managers or office portions of teams. Um, and then also just hearing uh, about higher levels of efficiency or profitability um, that companies or organizations are finding within context as well. And so the last thing I wanna leave you with, this is an, is an update um, from a couple of months ago, showing some of the utilization um, and the, uh, the, the data gathering since our launch in uh, January of 2019. Um, so here, one of the things that's new on here, for those of you who have seen something similar in the past, is now what we're seeing is the blue dots are representing uh, wetland sample points being collected and the green points being upland sample points. So we're, I'm excited to see how this will grow throughout the, the upcoming field season. And oh, we don't need to see that again. So I want to just transition over into our two presenters um, here. And so we are going to start things off um, with, uh, with the EOS uh, collector uh, Ecobot workflow. And Scott Denham from ESI is going to be starting us off with his presentation. And he's going to be focused on, I believe, a little bit on uh, threatened and endangered species workflow. So um, hopefully none of you will ever have to use the forest to get your truck out of a wetland. All right, Scott. All right. Oops. There we go. Um, hi, everybody. As Jeremy said, I'm Scott Denham. I work for ESI. I'm our company's wetlands and permitting manager. Uh, we do everything from wetland delineations to 404, 401 permitting, uh, t &E surveys, wetland mitigation, restoration, and so forth. Um, we're a company out of Ohio. Um, we have little satellite offices across the U.S. Um, we're a full-time staff of about 60, and we are pretty niche-based in um, environmental work with just a small engineering group that works with us. Um, keep shifting the screen on me. Um, um, we serve public and private clients, municipalities, we do transportation projects, pretty much anything you can think of that um, runs into the Endangered Species Act or Clean Water Act. Um, we've been through a different of GPS units over the course of time. Um, we found some that have worked the best for us in the last uh, few years. Um, since I've been with ESI, we pair with the EOS Aero unit. Um, we seem to work really well with, with them. We range anywhere between their 100 units to their gold units, just simply what you want to get out of um, your data. The gold in their units can actually connect to an RTK network, so they can get you extreme accuracy in certain areas if you can actually connect to that network. Um, we can get all the way to about eight centimeters of accuracy actually with, with those units. And then majority of our staff is using the Aero 200 units. And we pair that with uh, Survey123 at times. We also majority use Collector. Um, now, as Jeremy mentioned, we're shifting over to using field maps, which is 
basically just a partner of and run by the same platform. So it's a, a seamless transition for the most part. Um, and then we pair it with our um, iOS tablets or iPhones. Uh, one really good thing about um, putting these two things together is, is the live mapping and being able to use that as you go along. You're getting away from having to take paper copies out all the time. So as you know, as when you go out in the field, you have mud, you have rain, bugs, um, smudging your hand on it with sweat and everything else. It is kind of nice to have everything on, on your phone or on your tablet, and you can kind of zoom in and zoom out and see where you're working um, in a seamless Bluetooth transition and getting your workflow done. Uh, we do a lot of uh, ecological assessments, and we do them all over. I primarily do them in the tri-state area, so Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. Um, we did a, about a 23-acre ecological assessment, and so I'm going to kind of show you guys what we did over there, and then also about a two-mile natural gas line in West Virginia. Just kind of comparing the two, it's very similar data collection, uh, just kind of two different styles of projects for some that are mainly more energy-based versus people that are more land development. And we, the purpose of this was to determine the extent of wetlands, um, aquatic resources that we find out there. So we did a full-on wetland stream delineation. And as well as since we're doing an ecological assessment, we had t &E habitat surveys. So anything that would hit the county lists, IPAC um, states like, so we were running those, seeing what we needed to find while we we're out there. And also just a general wildlife uh, habitat study. So anything we would see, whether it was a snapping turtle, uh, a fawn, anything like that, you know, is, is marked down on there. Um, we also do land cover classifications, and we do these in most of our projects. It seemed to be more and more with companies that uh, they want to see them. Regulators seem to want to see it more. They want you kind of classify everything you're seeing while you're out there just to give them a little bit more background. Uh, we saw that a lot in this last year where regulators could not go out to sites. So they really wanted you to capture what was out there while they were trying to look at it via desktop. And the more that you could explain to them and the more that you could show them, the easier it was to get your workflow across. Uh, we, we use an offline data collection. Um, you can run EOS and Art Collector live if you have good um, reception and cell reception and have a data package to be able to use that. Uh, we tend to use an offline version, so we just download the map to the extent that we want, and we go out there and we can run the mapping that way, and it's saved, and we can sync later on. That tends to work really well then in areas that are very remote. So we can have the map, we can just kind of keep running along. Otherwise, you can kind of run into connectivity issues where things don't get synced up at all. Um, otherwise, if you're working in, say, the city of Columbus in Ohio, you have great cell reception most of the time. You could run the map live. And in that point, my GIS staff back in the office could actually watch me collect data as I go along. So a little bit of a big brother aspect to it, but uh, they can definitely see what I'm doing, see if I'm doing something wrong and kind of give me a call and I can adjust it if needed. Um, the good thing about it is that it's a very easy uh, data output. So data collection is very easy. It brings in all your files, your geodatabase, uh, feature classes, your CVS files and shape files that you can basically just hit sync right away as soon as I'm done. As soon as I have reception, as soon as I'm close to uh, Wi-Fi, or if I'm not running it live, I can hit it and it can send it straight up, straight up to my GIS staff. We can in instantly pull everything down. So there's no more plugging it into your computer, pulling out a chip, sticking it in your computer, trying to run wires and see if you can get it to work, having to have a third party transfer system to get it there. This is a seamless process um, all the way through. Um, just the pictures that are over there is just, we did a bat habitat survey um, and PRTs potential roost trees. It's a running buffalo clover survey as well. And just kind of an idea of like all the different parameters that you can you can take while you're out there. So this is a quick video of basically just connecting your uh, the EOS unit um, via Bluetooth to collector. Just, just click on the screen, Scott. That'll get it running. All right. There you go. And so for this, you just need to get them within, you know, a couple of feet of each other. You can go ahead and connect them, the arrow unit to your iPad itself. It's very easy. 
just like you're connecting AirPods or anything else. Um, EOS has this platform where you can show your, your latitude, longitude. It can show all the satellites that you're actually attached to, um, which is great then because you can see how well your connectivity is. Um, this one, as I was sitting in you know, my office, so it says there's no differential, but um, it's great then you can see what your accuracy is, see if there's something wrong, see if you need to make an update. And this is their EOS uh, Pro Tools function to it. Next, then you just go right into uh, our collector. And what you need to do is build yourself a profile and make sure it's connected. So this is just showing that this is the, the arrow unit that's connected to it, making sure you have the right one. Those serial numbers are just right on the unit itself. And then you just make sure you can add the receiver and so that that's the one that you're connected to. Once you uh, do that, it's very important of all things to make sure that you have a very good profile. Um, EOS is very good with working with you too, if you're not really sure how you wanna do that. Uh, you build your own profile, that way you know you're in the right network and you're getting the most accuracy um, that you possibly can. And then you can actually adjust your accuracy how you want it. If you wanna make sure you can take things within 10 feet, you know, only a foot, because it'll stop you from being able to take anything then you know, outside of that one foot or two feet or three feet, whatever you decide you want to do. Next, this is um, a site in Ohio that we did. We did a aquatic resource delineation and teeny survey, habitat survey out there. So this is just a, a quick um, view of kind of how we collect data, um, not an exhaustive, version of it, but just some different things that you can collect and pick up with this and how easy it can be and how beneficial it can be to use. This is just a project overview of, you can see all the different layers that we have on there already, um, different divider lines, um, polygons and points that were out there. It'll kind of slide over and show you some of the things you can collect. Uh, these are just an example of ones that we do. We have habitat patch points, potential roost tree locations, our stream and wetland polygons. And we like to color code them a little bit different so it really stands out and you can visually see them. And then also it translates to our mapping. So an example, this was just the habitat patch point. We wanted to say, you know, classify everything that was out there. Go ahead and drop our our points, you can enter your project name, your county. There's a bunch of different stuff on here you can add down to it. This one, we use the NL, NCLD clever classes. So you could just say it's the a cultivated crops or scrub, shrub, forest, um, anything else that you kind of see while you're out there. And then you can go down the list. You can put as little or as much data as you want into it. This is a pretty large list of data to collect. Um, you build this and then you can kind of use it over and over and over and change it over the course of time. Once you do that, then how we collect it is that we use a habitat divider line. And this is just a, a quick way of showing how you can just lock it in. As you notice, some of the other black lines on the screen, uh, we can box and things in and we can make polygons. And what's really nice about that is as you do that, as long as you connect the lines, it's a seamless polygon for your GIS. When you want to bring it down into ArcGIS, desktop or, or pro, um, it automatically then can link these together for you. So as long as you connect them across, you know, your study corridors or your lines, then you can really show a, an easy habitat box out of certain areas. This was a, just an example of a potential roost tree um, for the Indiana bat or the bat. You can add in whether it's a live tree, dead tree, partial. Like I said, we built this in, in Collector. Um, what's really nice is that everything that we've built into Collector like this and all the data that we're taking then instantly shoots out into tables for us to use. And so, and we can actually take those tables and pull them out into data sheets. So instead of having to have a hard copy data sheet for a lot of things that we wanna take out there, similar to how we use Ecobot for wetland delineation, um, data sheets. We're kind of doing that on the other end, but just more of like an internal way of pulling the data out. And as you can see where it said it was stored on device, this is because the map was downloaded. So all the data that we're collecting is being stored right in this map at this point in time, the map is not being run live. And then later we would sync and send it to the cloud. 
this is an example of just picking up a, a perennial stream polygon. Um, you can just kind of see how it, it really breaks it out, enter in your stream names, uh, any other information that you need for your data collection. As you build the point, it kind of builds it around it. And this is just a polygon. You can run streamlines with it as well. You can run stream points if you want to do it that way, however you want to collect your data. This seems to be kind of clean and quick, and we can get measurements off of this as well in case for some reason we were out in the field and we forgot to get some measurements. If your accuracy is really good, you can take a lot of measurements right off of, of what you're building. And this is kind of just a final, final project of what, what things look like. Um, you can take habitat wildlife points. So example, this was just, you know, we found a cottontail rabbit while out there and, you know, think of why in the world do you care if a rabbit's running around the site? Well, for pe places like the power sighting boards and things like that, they want to see what habitat could, in wildlife is using those areas. So you can create a separate point, um, put that on there. We have our NHD lines on there. We have our soil lines on there as well. So it's basically all the mapping that you kind of need all at once at, the at your fingertips and you can pull all your data down from that and you have everything that you need to view your site. So when you're all done and you have this nice pretty map with a bunch of dots and lines and points and polygons and everything else on there and it looks kind of crazy and confusing we get to the sync phase. And like I said, if you're running live mapping, then all of these, as soon as you're done collecting them, automatically get synced. So somebody could be actually viewing you as you're taking it. And we've, we've tried this before. We've had our GIS staff watch us collect points and see how accurate, how well it's going through. And it's very good as long as you have good service. If you don't, you have to run through this process, which is just a sync phase. And like I said, you're not using an SD card, you're not using any cores, anything else. This is simply getting service and connecting it. And so you can see the double arrow in the cloud and it has a little nut red number on it. So this is already stored on the collector device. It's as easy as just clicking the up and down cloud and it'll start downloading and it'll or start uploading. It'll upload right up to the cloud. It'll say complete and you can be done. Now say you wanna get rid of your map. You don't wanna use it. All you have to do is manage it. You can say remove features only if you don't want to have those features on there. You can remove the features in the base map and it will completely take that off. And then you can start over. And you need to do that pretty much at the end of every time so that any data that you collect and any data somebody else has collected on the same downloaded map, as long as you both sync and then clear your map and re-download, you will see each other's at all times. So that's very nice. If you're running live mapping, you can just watch somebody else collect data as, as you're doing it. So when you're all done doing that and you sync it up and whether you are running your GIS um, or somebody else is doing it for you, it really does speed it up. Um, our team efficiency in the field and office has been fantastic over the last few years. As technology gets better, we try to really dive into it just like everybody else is to see how our workflow can be faster, how we can improve, how our accuracy can be. These are questions that we're getting asked by clients, regulators, ourselves of, how we're doing this, you know, and we need to have really good accuracy. They want to see it and they, they're kind of expecting it now, especially with all the things that are out there. Um, it's nice because the data transfer, it's a direct import to shape files into ArcGIS. When you're on um, ArcGIS, you can, on collector, you can do ArcGIS online. You can see everything you have collected out there. You can pull it down to ArcGIS um, or you can just do it live right on, on the web viewer. It allows us a professional data package. We're able to pull these polygons and these lines out. As you can see, some of the mapping that we ha I have on here, those black divider lines, as soon as they come across, we color coordinate, coordinate them per different points. And we can do then our cover classes in there. And it's just a nice, clean picture all the way across of, here's what new field looks like. Here's deciduous forest. Here's this. Here's a perennial stream running through here. Here's a wetland running through here. And you're able to see all this instead of having a black and white sketch map or even Google Earth map because Google Earth can be kind of doesn't really show everything you want to show on there or the layers don't come out very well. So, um, as well as you can see the the PRT data collection, 
this is what it spits out when you're all done. You collect all this data, you have this nice worksheet then that we can pull off and use for our files, or we can leave right on there, even export this into a Google Earth KMZ and send this to the client and they could have all this data then if they would like the digital version of it as well. Um, so it's a clean and detailed data package for you know, our state and federal agency reviews. Um, it's, it's definitely less paperwork for us in the field. And I'll, every year we have to go through the federal permit system for a lot of our t &E species for um, our biologists. And the cleaner everything is, we can show all these projects, we can show how many things were being, how many bats were being caught, how many snakes were being caught, things like that, how many projects that we did. And it's really easy because now it's all lined up for us and we can submit that data off and just re-up our permits for each year. I think that's- Great, thank you, Scott. And uh, yeah, it's been awesome working with you guys and working with EOS over the last few years. And now I'm gonna, we're gonna switch over to Callie, who's uh, we've just been working with for a few months, like I said, but also, um, We've been working with Trimble for a number of years as well. So we're really excited to hear about how you guys are doing things at DUDEC. Callie. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and thank you, Scott. You went over a lot of information that I did not. So I'm glad that, um, that you went first so that we can kind of get a good picture of all the different options out there. <clears throat> Let's see here. Did you give me remote control? Yes. There we go. Okay. <laughs> it's taking a second to catch up. Let me back up a couple slides because it just, just fast forwarded. Anyways, um, as Jeremy mentioned, I'm Callie Amwaku. I work at Dudek out of our California Encinitas office. I do um, wetland delineations, jurisdictional determinations, different species surveys and uh, write lots of reports. Um, Dudek is a environmental consulting firm and engineering. Um, we serve a variety of clients uh, ranging from, you know, private, uh, public agencies, transportation, um, energy sectors, education, uh, city planning, um, all sorts of, all sorts of things. Um, and, you know, basically this doesn't, um, my presentation doesn't go through a case study. Uh, it just kind of talks more about, you know, my workflow uh, using, you know, the, the R1 collector, um, Esri collector, Ecobot, and, you know, just kind of the getting into the weeds a little bit on a couple things um, and the possibilities and just how it helps me uh, be more efficient in the field and create you know higher quality products um i found this photo while i was looking <laughs> there's some photos and i remember when i started working at dudek in 2006 we were using these backpack trimble receivers and it just made me laugh to think how far we've come we were phasing them out at that point um into kind of an older version of of this handheld before we transferred over into this the GOXT uh, 6000 and 7000 and now we're phasing into the um, the R1s which we're primarily using at this point um, but if you're still using these this is a great presentation for you um, because you might want to upgrade a little bit so in addition to you know your typical field gear that you would take for doing any delineation um, you know, some of the things Jeremy already covered is you want to have your either your phone or your tablet that has, um, in my case, you know, we're still using collector. We we're, we're phasing over to field maps, but we haven't made that move yet. So we're still using collector. Um, we've got the R1 and the Ecobot app really helps to um, digitize all the, your field forms and get that information live without having to do you know, manual calculations and looking up stuff. So that's definitely reduces a lot of stuff you have to take in the field. And then I always have an extra battery pack because using these uh, throughout the day really drains my battery. So um, really good idea to have a battery pack 
with you if you um, start moving over into this data collection. <clears throat> and um, so what I really like about using collector is when you're doing your prep for the field, um, you can actually ask, in my case, I asked my GIS to add certain layers that I want into my app that I'm gonna be doing for that project. Um, so for example, you know, the project boundary, obviously you want to have that in there, what kind of aerial imagery you're using, um, but then also things like the NHD, uh, NWI, you know, really help me to kind of focus in on some areas that I want to look at if I, especially if I'm doing a larger project study. Um, if you have project specific contours, that can be really helpful in kind of seeing, you know, how steep things are or where you might be able to, um, you know, make sure that when you're recording information that it's lining up with your, your contours and, and you can kind of give yourself a little QA, QC in the field with your receiver. If you have um, project specific vegetation mapping that's already been done, you could look for, you know, different riparian communities and you could just specifically add those. Or if you have regional vegetation mapping, you know, you could use that as kind of a general guide as well. So what I like to do is, you know, tell, ask GIS to add all the different layers that I want to have available to me in the field on collector. And then I can also, when I'm in the office, I can draw, you know, different points of target areas that I want to visit, um, things like that. Uh, so I, I find that to be really helpful. And then Scott went over this kind of in detail, um, but you can either download your map offline if you're working in a remote area, or, you know, you can keep it online if you are going to have, you know, decent reception. Um, so those are just kind of some decisions that you need to make based on where your project site is. And then just making sure that you have all of the features that you wanna be able to collect in the field. This is just a very simplified version kind of focusing on, in on uh, the JD, but obviously, you know, you can have tons of different points, polygons, lines um, for whatever features you wanna collect. Um, I really like having the photo point in there so that I, it really helps me, you know, not having to download photos, remember where I took them, geo tag them in Google Earth and label them. It's that's probably one of my most favorite parts about Collector. <clears throat> so once you're set up in the field, you've paired your device, um, you know, you're connected. And this is just a little video over here kind of showing, you know, how to actually you know, add your receiver, Jeremy already went, or I'm sorry, Scott already went over this. So, you know, we're, we're good on that, but it does help you just, you know, if you've never used this, just kind of understanding the workflow, there's a couple little things you need to do. Um, and then this will update once you are, you know, the, it's, it's getting all the different satellites and connecting that it'll increase the accuracy. All right. Okay, so another um, another thing that you know you can customize in your settings is the accuracy, like Scott said. So if you want to ensure to sub meter accuracy, you know you can go into the settings. Um, <clears throat> you can update it with whatever inches, feet, you know, whatever the distance is <clears throat> that you want for your accuracy. And like he said, it will not collect data if you don't have that accuracy. Um, the other thing you can do is set your photo size. You can set your streaming intervals. Um, I like to have it at one second so that it's very precise. But if you have a larger area, you know, you might be able to do something like every five seconds. Um, the more data it collects, obviously the larger file it is. So that's kind of where that comes into play. <clears throat> and let's 
go to the next page. All right. So once you've, um, you know, you, you're all set up in the field, you collect your sample points, you can add your points either to collector, you can add them directly into Ecobot, kind of depends on what workflow you're using. You've determined your wetland boundaries. Um, you know, I put a couple of screenshots up here from the Ecobot app because I like that, you know, it's much easier to just kind of see all of your information immediately, you know, once you collect it and um, you don't really have to double check too much stuff while you're in the field. So, you know, you've got your, your wetland, you've got your line where you're out of your wetland. Um, and then I have a couple examples on the next page of, you know, just how people can collect data. These are not case studies, um, but they are some examples. Sorry, I have a little bit of a delay here. Um, so this one is just an example of how you can stream. So this would be similar to using the GeoXT where you, you know, you've, you've created your file and you are walking along your wetland or along your, your channel, you know, whatever it is that you want to collect. Um, so you start streaming. And, you know, this is just a quick example. This is in my backyard. It's not how I would actually uh, create a polygon, but just kind of wanted to give you an example of what it looked like to stream. You can start and stop streaming if you need to pause it. You know, maybe you have to walk around something and, and you know, start collecting on the other side. So again, similar to the GeoXT, but you actually have your aerial map that you can use to kind of check where you are, which I think is, is super helpful. All right, so I think we get the gist of that one. And then the, the other option is if you say, for example, you've streamed a polygon, but you come to an area where you don't have access, you know, maybe it's fenced off or there's a bunch of poison oak or there's water that you don't really wanna wade through because you don't have the equipment or, you know, whatever the situation is, but you have a good view on the aerial of where you could manually add those points. So this is just an example of, of how you can manually add points um, in collector to create your polygon. And then I purposely did a little mess up here to show how you can, you know, undo a point if you if you add something where you don't want it to be without having to start over your entire polygon. So you can go in and say, delete that point and then continue your mapping. Um, and then these fields are all customizable. So, you know, you can have um, the different fields that you want to collect. Again, those will be exported into a table. As Scott mentioned, you can have drop down lists in here to, you know, kind of streamline your QA, QC. Uh, you can have required fields. You can have fields that are not, you know, not required. It really depends on your project and you know, how you want to collect that data, what you want the output to look like. Um, you know, collecting as much data in here really reduces the, the, the back end time um, that you spend kind of QA, QCing your, your products. Um, and then you submit it. This is an example of, uh, you know, online. So if you were working offline, it would be the same workflow. It's just that in this example, um, you know, your, your information would then be available to your other team members or your GIS staff back at the office. Um, similar to Ecobot, you can duplicate your data. So if you want to duplicate a point, um, you've already filled out a bunch of your information in the project and you don't want to refill it out every single time, you can duplicate it, add a new location, and then just edit, you know, maybe your number or, you know, whatever thing is specific to that point. So you could, so in this example, you know, I'm just updating my sample point and 
you know, maybe my hydrology is a yes here. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and change that. But otherwise I didn't really have to fill out my name, date, project number, things like that. Um, and, you know, when you're ready to view the data, again, you know, if you're working online, it's pretty much immediately available. So if I have, um, you know, say 100 acres or so project site, and I have a team that started on one end and I started on the other and we're kind of working together, then I can see how much progress they've made because their data is live. Or if, you, if you're both syncing, um, well, okay, we'll, we'll it, it doesn't really work the same as working offline in order to be able to see each other's data. You both have to sync and, and do some other things. Um, but if you're working online, then you can see where everybody's working, what data they've collected so far. Um, you can, you know, tell your GIS staff, hey, we've collected some data. Um, you can start QAQ seeing it, you know, kind of however, you know, it depends on how fast you need to review things while you're in the field versus while you're in the office. And then there's a couple different options to review your data. Um, so ArcGIS has a collector desktop version, which will sync immediately to your data that's either collected online or once you've synced it and it's, you know, you synced your offline, then it'll also pull that up. And so if you wanna go in and, and look at where you've collected, um, what you've collected, if you wanna just edit it at all, you know, maybe you remember uh, you wanted to adjust one of the vertices a little bit here or there. Um, you wanna just make sure that you've, you know, checked everything out or you just wanna in general view, you know, the different, the different things that somebody has collected on your project site, then you could do that in um, the collector app. And then another option is a geo portal, which is a lot more similar to using ARC uh, maps. It's just a, you know, you don't need a license to use this. So you can set up a geo portal. You could have this available to your client if they like to review your data um, or, you know, see what you've collected and, what I like about it is that it has this option where you can kind of see everything in what would you know be similar to an Excel format. So if you click on this little um, this little triangle, it'll pull up all the different data that you've collected on the different layers that you have in your geo portal. And so, for example, I can look at you know this polygon over here. I can see what we've mapped it as and um, I can edit these if I wanna add some additional information here, I can do that. You can also do a little bit of editing to the feature itself. Um, if you, again, if you, you know, needed to adjust something here or there. Um, so those are some different options. And then obviously, you know, you've got your arc, your arc map in, you know, the Esri, um, license that will have all of this information in it. But these are just kind of more user friendly for non GIS people. All right, let's get to the next page. Maybe. <laughs> um, so, a couple of the benefits that I just wanted to go over, I think Scott mentioned a lot of these and, and showed some great examples. Um, but you know it really reduces that post-processing time. <laughs> Hold on, we've gone a little too far. Okay, catch it. One more. Okay, there we go. So, oh good. All right, sorry guys. Um. So one of the things that I like is that I don't have to go into the office to sync my data. I don't have to plug in my GPS unit, go into Pathfinder, download it, save it into a folder, tell JS, okay, here's here's your data that's available. I can, you know, do all of that <clears throat> just on my phone or my tablet. And I can also review what it looks like. So that way, 
you know, I don't know if you've ever had bad satellites and you have like that one point that's just like a hundred feet off of your, your, you know, line that wasn't meant to be there. <clears throat> you don't really have to deal with those things. So it makes the QAQC a lot faster and the cleanup a lot faster. And you've got your data linked to your, um, your layers, you know, in a more customizable way than what you're really able to do with um, the, the other receivers. It, I like it because it allows me to have, you know, more preparation when I'm in the field. So I can really make sure that I'm doing a hundred percent thorough job and it reduces me having to go back out in the field a lot when I'm able to do that. Um, I can, you know, again, like we've mentioned, you can have a lot more collaboration with your team in the, um, the, the field to see where you guys are working in the office, if you need to have, if you have a really quick turnaround and you need to be able to say, okay, I'm done with this section. Now I need you guys to go in and QA, QC it, or now you can go and create a field map or a preliminary map to, you know, show the client what they have on their site. You know, you can do things like that. You can have the geo portals that set up for a client if they want to kind of be looking at, you know, what you're mapping in real time. You know, there's a lot of different options um, for that. So I think overall, it just helps me be more efficient. It helps to have higher quality products. Um, yeah, like other people have mentioned, you know, it doesn't, it reduces the amount of paper products that you have. Um, and note taking, dealing with, you know, rain, ruining your notes, things like that, you know, you just kind of eliminates a lot of those troublesome things. And then my last slide is just a little bit of a, you know, for fun, if it, if, you know, in a couple minutes when it progresses to that slide. Um, How about I just steal the control back and just do it? There we go. <laughs> There you go. So I don't know if you can see the bottom, but it says uh, searching for wetlands in Southern California. <laughs> so we don't have a lot of wetlands down here. <laughs> and we have a little bit more complicated areas down here. Um, but that's the end of my presentation. And I will be available for questions at the end. Great, thank you, Callie, and thank you, Scott. Both just great granular dives into the details in this and a, just a great reminder that we are in the 21st century and our industry is really gonna see an upswing in our capabilities um, in, in the ensuing year. So just a little plug for July, we'll be meeting on July 21st uh, Fish and Wildlife and the Army Corps of Engineers will be joining us. We're going to be talking a little bit about the IPAC um, and the uh, the whole process of beginning uh, Section 7, Section 10, and uh, other wetland uh, projects as well within that context. So we'll be excited and hope to have you join us then. Um, this is uh, not a picture that I took, but uh, we do. Have, my wife and I do have hellbenders living on our stream. Uh, here in our property in Highlands, North Carolina. So I do want to just go ahead and segue over. We are pretty much at the top of our hour. If, if uh, you can stick around for a few moments, looks like there's a handful of questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to just jump out of the uh, screen share here and uh, take a look at some of the questions we have coming through. So, um, you know, this is, let's see, multiple questions on the arrow, our collector. What is the Zoom resolution of the map screen? Does it require a subscription? Can multiple individuals work on the same map? Um, so uh, maybe, uh, Scott, you want to address, address Chuck's question there? Yeah. Um, you can actually set your uh, Zoom resolution almost as high as you want to. Um, it, it only hurts your download size. So if you're going to download a large map offline, the more you zoom in, the bigger the data file is going to be. So it may not actually download enough for your, your iPad or iPhone to actually hold it. But um, you can get to city block. I mean, you can get zoomed in really well within a couple of feet. When you zoom in too much on it, you tend to 
jump around quite a bit more than you think. Um, multiple people can work on the map at the same time. If it's a live map, multiple people can work on it and you can see each other's data points as it's they're getting placed down. Um, however, you, there's also a chance for overlap too. So you just wanna make sure that like your data is not overlapping somebody else's data at the same time. Um, additionally, we've had upwards of 25 people working on the same map at one time. We're not necessarily working in the exact same location, um, but even if we are, I can split a stream in half. I could have one person take the first 50 feet and stream a line that way. And I can have somebody else stream the other 50 feet the other way. It still gets synced together the same way. So at the very end, everyone syncs their data and it gets put in and we can pull it down. Um, the only thing you wanna watch out for is when that happens is that if I collect something on a stream and somebody else collects the same data on the stream right on top of me, if I sync first, and they sync after me, it's only going to show their data on top of mine. Um, you'd have to kind of go back and find where mine went, but it will, there is a, a layer of authority where like their data could come on top of it, but you can run, like I said, up to upwards as many people as you want on, on the map at a time. Great, and then Scott, while you're on there, uh, Cynthia has asked roughly what you're paying per staff member to run to have an EOS era an art collector on a per month or per year basis? So EOS themselves, other than buying the actual receiver, we, there is no subscription for anything that we're using for them. So after you buy the, the GPS receiver, then it's your receiver. Um, they range from about $1,800 to about $5,000. The higher up you wanna go, um, and don't necessarily quote me exactly those costs, but somewhere around in that range, um, I think the 200 units are around 2000 and, and maybe $3,500 or 4000 for the, the gold units. Um, they have different levels of what you can buy and purchase from them. Once you purchase it, it's yours. Like I said, we run 100s, 200s gold units. So we have a lot of different ones. There's no software package to run. Um, EOS, EOS Pro Tools then is downloadable for free. Then once you have um, the unit, as far as uh, our collector, I, I believe we have almost 50 or 60 licenses. I'm not sure um, exactly what each license is. Um, I know that uh, we buy a bulk license and it comes down. So maybe Jeremy or Callie has a better idea. Um, but I know we have about five or six Arc desktop accounts, but then you can run as many as, many as you want to pay for basically on, on ArcGIS. Um, and I think it's you can see it right on their site when you look up on there too. I think it gives you their pricing. Great, thanks, Scott. So Kelly, I wanna jump over to you and kind of continue in, in the vein that Chuck was asking about in respect to um, resolution with, you know, are you seeing anything different than what Scott's seen in the utilization of the R1 with collector? And yeah. No, I think we have about the same experience using R1 um, versus collector. You know, there's a couple different options for R1s. They range, I think, usually around $2,500 um, for the ones that I've looked at. I don't do any of the purchasing. We have our GIS stock that does that. Unfortunately, I can't answer questions on costs. I don't know how much our, our GIS collector um, costs either. I'm sorry, I did not um, prepare for that question. Um, but I think like Scott said, you know, you can find the prices um, pretty quickly. Um, in terms of accuracy, you know, it's the same thing. Essentially, if you're downloading offline, the more you want to zoom in, the larger your file is. And then sometimes um, you have to download, you know, multiple areas um, because you're zooming in so close. So you may not be able to, you know, capture such a large area um, for your offline map but you can download mul you know, multiple offline maps to work in and then that way it gives you um, a greater resolution. And then the same thing if you're working online, it really depends on the you know, base layer that you're using. Um, oftentimes, so that we don't bog down our systems too much, we will have a specific app created that clips the aerial imagery to our project boundary or you know maybe just outside of our project boundary and then that way we can have you know higher resolution without having such a huge um uh you know map that's going to take up so much space when you when you have it on your phone um there was a question well i'll let you 
I'll let you carry the questions. Jim. Yeah, I wanted so I want to pick you. So Mike Peterson asked a question about the R1 in respect to uh, utilization under heavy canopy. You know, I've I've used the R1 and the EOS Arrow, and um, my experience with the R1 is under denser canopy cover. It does lose some of its uh, granularity or its accuracy. I mean, it's still. Uh, in most cases, I find it still accurate enough for what I would be working with. But mm -hmm. do you want to address that, uh, Callie, as well? Yeah, I definitely find that it loses its accuracy when it's under canopy. Um, so I either have to increase my, you know, limit on the accuracy from say sub meter to you know a couple meters, or um, that's when I like to kind of pair it with. <laughs> Why'd you go dark, Jeremy? I like right. to pair it with, you know, maybe contours that we have specific for that project so I can look a little bit more into, uh, you know, I can, I can, like, if I say my project has two foot contours and my accuracy is six foot on, on that R1 for under that canopy, then I might tweak the data a little bit to be more in line with the contours. Um, but yeah, I find it to be similar to some of those GOXTs where you lose you lose a little bit of the resolution in those circumstances. Okay, and so one of the other things Mike asked there, now I don't, I use field maps and collector just basically for the background shape files. I'm not actually collecting any data in it, but one of the things Mike was asking is about, um, you know, the, the draw on the battery. Um, you know, like I'm mostly using EcoBot and the processing on that's super low. And so it doesn't draw on the battery very much. What, um, you know, what, what are you finding? And do you, have you found any solutions other than just carrying the extra power packs with you? I always turn mine on um, the low battery, kind of the battery conservation, um, which helps prolong it a little bit. If I have my phone out in the field, the battery is going to be drained probably within half of a day if I don't recharge it. But if you have an iPad, which has a much larger battery compared to the phone, then I find that those, you know, you can use those for a little bit longer. You know, you might get a full day out of it, depending on, um, you know, how, if you're really streaming, you know, uh, multiple apps for the entire day, you might need to recharge that. Um, but if you're using a phone, you'll definitely need to recharge it. Um, yeah, the only thing really is just you can minimize, you know, maybe how long if you if you're driving between sites, you can obviously recharge, you know, in your car, but um, I, I always have a battery pack with me because it drains my battery. Great. So there's there's two questions I want to pair together here. One's from Dietrich Gates, which sounds like he's uh, hailing from down in the Galveston district in Texas and also uh, Stephen Hoffman. Um, so, you know, one of the things in here asking about the GNSS metadata um, when logging in these applications. I mean, I know that uh, Ecobot and Field Maps, as well as a lot of these pairing apps that we can use with these GNSS uh, uh, pieces, receivers, um, get, you know, lets you know what, when you're reaching the uh, necessary PDOT for, um, but I don't know, Scott, do you wanna talk about that a little bit? Um, is, I mean, I know that we've been able to meet all of those needs for Galveston just within the context of Ecobot when paired with, but mm -hmm. what, would you, what would you add to that? Yeah, I would say it's, it's the same. Um, the GNS metadata is, I mean, readily available. You can pull it and you can see it. Uh, like I said, we've had clients, we've had districts ask us for accuracy, especially when doing like some stream restoration things. They wanna see how accurate everything is. We've had to show them these specific points are eight centimeters. These are this. I mean, we've had to get, basically hand them all of our, our data through. Um, yeah, we've been able to meet that. I think that is actually one of the things that these companies are, they pride themselves on too, is being able to like full disclosure show like that here's the data, here's what you're collecting. Um, biggest thing is just making sure that like your collection profile and things are set up appropriately so that when you're collecting this data, it is how you want it. And it's definitely set up that way for you to be able to do that. Great, Kelly, you wanna add anything to that? Nope, I think, okay. I mean, usually if I need to get that data, I just ask JS to download the metadata for that. 
but again, you can customize it to make sure that you're only collecting data that is with one, what, you know, whatever your parameters are as well. All right, so let's piggyback off of that with, with Stephen's question here, the post-processing of that GPS data in these particular workflows. I mean, to me, that's one of the most exciting parts about this, but Stephen's asking, are you using RTK networks? Um, how does it work when you're offline? So why don't we start with you, Callie, and then we'll go back to Scott. Can someone tell me what RTK network is? <laughs> okay. Um, so it's basically, yeah, it's, well, so maybe the, you know, the easiest answer to this really, Stephen, is that we're not having to do all of that post-processing um, because those corrections uh, are being made and it's relaying off of base stations um, mm -hmm. as, as you're recording, especially with these settings that Kali and Scott are talking about here that you can set up in advance so that it's only it's mm -hmm. only recording data when those parameters are being met. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, whereas before when we would download the GPS data, our GIS team would then correct it using the latest. Okay. So I think I understand. I, I know that that occurs. Again, I'm not a GIS uh, expert. We have our own team that does that, but it sounds like that is what the yes. So as Jeremy said, it's kind of doing all those corrections, um, you know, more in real time. So we're not having to post process it. Uh, we haven't had to do that since switching over to collector and pairing it with the R1s. We haven't had to do post processing corrections as far as I know. Um, I guess I would have to double check with our team, but um, I don't believe there there is that post processing that occurs. Maybe Scott could weigh in on that. Yeah, um, as far as post-processing goes, the idea is that there is no post-processing. I mean, that's their goal. Um, and even talking like in a long detail with um, with EOS and before even talking um, with Trimble, that the idea is you're trying to limit the amount of post-processing because it's actually a greater risk of manipulating your data in the wrong way. I mean, there's a chance that you could actually overcorrect, or undercorrect data. Um, um, yeah, with the RTK networks, um, real-time kinematic, it's basically a bunch of base stations, a big network where there's taken survey data from numerous different people, and it's highly accurate. Mostly it's high-end survey data. Um, when you can connect to those, uh, we've only connected to them live, um, using live mapping, and a lot of times your big cities, things like that, there's a ton of data, and you're able to connect to them. Some allow you to actually connect to these networks for free. There's actually, a, you can just log in, subscribe, and they'll kind of count you in. Others, they make you pay, you know, X amount of, for a month to run the network and, and be in there. And for some of your projects, it might be it might be worth it. And it just allows it to correct itself down to a, you know, better accuracy while you're out there. Whereas when you're out, as you're saying, you're only allowed to take data in the parameters in which you have set. So if you're kind of outside of that, or you're not really hitting satellites, you might have to wait a little bit longer to let it come down. Um, but once you pull the data back, it's it's auto correcting, um, self correcting as it's going. There is no the post process is simply to make sure that your data that you collected, whatever you typed in, or maybe the lines that you drew and polygons that you did, look visibly appealing and make sure it's the right data that you've had. But as far as data correction um, from the satellites, it's it's there's no post processing to it. Yeah, that's great. And so. Um... You know, we're, we're almost 15 minutes over here, so I do want to kind of round us off so everybody can go back to your days. One thing I do want to polish on here, uh, Chuck had been asking questions about replacing the Tremble Geo 7X. So uh, Chuck, if you, you know, I don't know if you're in, uh, Gail Shea is on, on the background of this conversation as well, and she can certainly help you out with some of the information there. But in respect to output, I mean, the, yes, the outputs from these are, are uh, GIS files, but you know, with Esri products now, it's very easy to export a, a shapefile packet as um, you know, DXF or DWG packet. I mean, Scott, you guys probably do that pretty frequently, especially with your utility projects you guys are working on. Yeah, yeah, it's really easy to pull it over. Everyone requests, oh, nobody, 
yeah, nobody wants just a KMZ and they want this shape files pulled down and mostly we're sending yeah. to engineers and they, they want those files and it's really easy just to convert it over. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Well, Scott, Callie, thank you again for jumping on. We had a lot of great technical questions here. So really appreciate you all jumping in and uh, the presentations that you made were very helpful and uh, look forward to connecting with you all soon. And for those of you who stuck it out with us, thanks for sticking out for an extra 15 minutes. Hopefully what we provided you with today gave you some more, uh, some more helpful information along the way with where things are going. And uh, we will look to see you next time back here on the uh, convergence of wetland science and technology. So take care, everybody. Bye.